right, here we are with our new barrel. Uh, this is going to be a 6.5 PRC. Like I said, we've got a Brux. One of the finest barrels in the land. A brand new Brux barrel, 6.5 millimeter. Uh, one and eight twist, I'm sorry. Stainless steel. One of my favorite barrel manufacturers for sure. Uh, Brux makes barrels for F-class shooters, which are some of the most picky, finicky guys uh, in the whole shooting world. So if they're good enough for bench rest guys, um, yeah, I'm confident. I've done plenty of Brux barrels. They all shoot awesome. I uh, love Barley in as well and Krieger. And all those barrels are great. So this action has been blueprint, right? So that involves removing material. So I've cut out, oh, 25 thousandths, we'll say, just, just to kind of round it uh, out of the threads. Uh, as I was going incrementally in, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the amount that I took was about 20 to 25 thousandths until I cleaned up completely, uh, like you see there. Uh, f I remember five thousandths off the face and about I a little less than that off the back of the lugs, which means we can't go off of a standard barrel. Uh, plus, this is a, a newer style Winchester with the uh, overkill 28 thread per inch barrel tenon. I don't know who at Winchester decided that 28 threads per inch <laughs> was ideal, but it is what it is. It still works. It's probably a stronger bond, a connection of anyway, finer thread. So what I did off camera, what I always do with these blueprinted actions, like I know I took about 25 thousandths, but you don't know for sure until you start making the barrel. So instead of doing that to a you know $400 barrel, I'm gonna do it on a piece of scrap steel. Usually your thread tenon length on a Winchester 70 is 730, 730 thousandths long from, from here to the shoulder. Well, in our case, we took about five thousandths off the face. So that's gonna make this all just a little bit longer and definitely wider as far as the diameter of the thread tenon. So what I do is I, as I said, I estimated. So the nominal standard thread tenon diameter is uh, 1.062, just like a Remington, uh, one and one sixteenth inch diameter uh, by 28 threads per inch. In our case, we took about 20 to 25 thousandths out. So what I'll do is, is machine a stub at 1.0, uh, I believe in this case it was 8.8. I went a little bit large uh, because I can always file it down and, and fit it to check. So this allows me to get a nominal diameter, a new diameter for our newly machined receiver um, and get our lengths established and all that stuff uh, beforehand, before we do the actual barrel. Uh, if this was an untouched receiver, I would just go ahead and, and cut it to, to specification and everything should be fine. So in our case, if I cut this to one and one sixteenth, that thing would be so loose, it would be unsafe. So the uh, whole point of this is to get a known diameter for our newly machined receiver. And just to check. So it's screwing in by hand, but also it's not, it's not jiggling in there. So we've got good, <clears throat> uh, good thread contact there. And it screws all the way in. With no problem by hand. Snugs up. And it ends up where it should inside there. I know you can't see in there, but um, the bolt's not gonna close because the cone breach is not machined. So obviously that's not gonna close, but uh, that's uh, that diameter does not change. That that specification is fine. <clears throat> now the bolt's going to sit in there different because the lugs have been machined, the internal lugs have been machined, the face, of the machine, all this has been machined, the face of this. So we still need to do some measurements to get our headspace number um, established. Uh, but uh, that's how I get around uh, an unknown uh, diameter. I'll just make a bunch of these 
keep them in the drawer as actions come in. You know, if, if that's how much it cleans up. If not, then I'll make another one, you know, just to check. Uh, so I end up with a whole bunch of these. I've got tons of Remingtons from, from over the years. Uh, same concept, just to, just to get, just to know that we're not too big and it's gonna be tight as, as crap or too loose and it's gonna be all jiggly and wiggly and unsafe. Uh, certainly don't want it loose. Uh, we can machine it on the tighter side and just kind of file down the tops of the threads if we need to, but um, this just eliminates any guesswork. So we know what our diameter is, we know what our thread pitch is, our TPI. So um, with uh, stripped, stripped bolt and uh, receiver, I'm gonna take some measurements from here to the face, here to the nose, uh, just, get, just to get some lengths and uh, head space. Um, so that's critical critical stuff to know as we're uh, machining that barrel. So I'll get that in the vise and do some measuring and record those numbers, calculate them, uh, and get ready to machine this new Rux barrel. All right, so I got the barrel now installed into my four jaw chuck. Uh, the back end's being held by the spider. Um, I've already centered up most of it, most of the way in the back end. Uh, but up here, I uh, just want to show kind of the quality of uh, the machine, the barrel, and the setup here. So what we got here is a Pupitast made by Mar, one ten thousandth dial indicator. So each little tick mark is one ten thousandth. We're talking the fourth decimal place behind the decimal point. I'm kind of, sorry, I don't have this on a tripod. But just spinning this thing, so just to show you, I am actually, you know, there's up, there's down. So it's not like I'm bottoming out on the, on the indicator or nothing. But that needle is dead nuts still. So <laughs> this barrel is within, I don't even know, a, a few millions. So we're running absolutely perfectly aligned here. If I can get the needle to move. Yeah, just touching it, you know. So there you go. This barrel is extremely. I mean, I'm. This is what I shoot for, for everything. You know, why, why accept two tenths when you can get zero? Right? So I'm not going to touch this. The chuck, this chuck is, is dialed in. Barrel's dialed in, that is. Sorry about the glare. So we're spinning absolutely perfectly concentric. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to part off the uh, stamped section of the barrel because, as I always say, I like I just give this back to the customer. They paid for the barrel. It's all their information. It's theirs to keep. So that's certainly going to shift this out. So I'll part that off. Normally I just get this close and then part it off and then and then get it this, you know, actually center it perfectly. But this uh, went really quickly and just a testament to Brooks barrels and their bores extremely extremely straight and with the with the barrel spinning you can look down the bore you know you don't see any any like you do with a certain barrels out there there's I mean just just straight as an arrow so like I said I'll, I'll double check the back end here get everything right and then uh, part it off and then proceed to machine the actual uh, thread tenant okay I got the barrel parted off uh, then I went in and skimmed past the face just to get a nice flat surface and I chamfered the hole to remove any burrs. Uh, one thing I always do, um, I've got sets of bushings, piloted bushings uh, for the reamer and uh, other uses. Um, these are incre incrementally sized from uh, 0 0.2552 I think is the smallest one, all the way up to 
five, six, eight. <clears throat> so we've got nine, a selection of nine to choose from. What I do is I find the one that fits the bore um, nominally. Um, obviously, you don't want a press fit <clears throat> or interference uh, because this is a hardened bushing, so we don't want to gall up the inside of the, the bore, but we also don't want it too loose. So before anything else, I find the bushing that fits properly, and then I'll use that on a range rod to kind of feed it in and kind of feel. And what I came up with on this one was 2560. So that's a nominal size, exactly right where it should be. Not too loose, not too tight. To be expected with a barrel like a Brooks, um, we're right on the money. So what I did was uh, then recenter the barrel because uh, the, for the, the forces of the parting blade and whatnot can, can skew it off a little bit. So I already just checked and I was off by one tenth, which is pretty surprising. Usually it pushes it off a little bit further than that, but so that's all good. Um, the barrel is recentered. Uh, I'm gonna face it off one more time now that it's perfectly centered on both ends and proceed to lay out my thread tenon and do some uh, machining on that. So we'll get the uh, receiver fit, uh, the cone breech cut, and then uh, the chambering. As I said earlier, I recentered off of the fresh, well, I recentered the barrel and then skim past and route the face to get that squared up. I laid out my line for the length of the thread tenon and I've already done a few cuts on it. Um, but uh, right now we're just turning the major diameter down and prepare for the next step. measurement 1.155 so about 70 75 to go <laughs> diameter has been turned so we're done with this tool so I'm gonna switch up put a little chamfer and then thread this guy now the Winchester these new Winchesters at least they have a relief cut inside the inside there right so there's no need for a relief cut on the uh, tenon so we're just gonna thread all the way as close as we can to the shoulder uh, with that. Crashing into it, obviously. So, I'm just gonna switch out to my threading tool. And this is a not a real nice threading tool made by AR Warner. Um, I use a lot of their products for lathe tools, turning tools. Um, this is a stand up threader, uh, which allows you to get real close to, uh, to a shoulder, kind of like this. 
this is the perfect situation for this tool. Uh, it's a high speed steel, 60 degree uh, threading tool. Um, this one's there. Uh, half, half inch uh, holder, uh, NV threader. Uh, kit number 18. Uh, I believe they still sell these. <clears throat> but they fit these inserts. So you can do all the way up to a 32 TPI thread if you needed to. Um, I'm not sh I can't remember what NV stands for offhand. I should probably know that, but <laughs> it's slipping my mind right now. But anyway, these are made out of uh, T15 high-speed steel, I believe. Last time I checked it was at least. So that's the threading tool we got here. And then I've got the, the uh, compound rest at uh, uh, 30 and a half degrees here. So it'll be threading in a traditional manner. So first thing I like to do is put a little chamfer on there, which just allows the tool to have a little bit of a ramp to kind of ride up on, rather than just a solid 90 degree wall. So we'll slow the machine down just a little bit, throw a chamfer on there, and then we'll set up for threading. So, we're going to take a real light pass <clears throat> and check our uh, threads for inch. Okay, touch off. like a real nice sharp uh, cutting edge still. Back off, check, make sure she's not just going to run away on me. Okay, good. And with 28, I can engage on any position. On the thread dial. So here comes two. Engage, take a pass, pull out. Okay, now I'm going to switch out to my magnifiers again. The older I get, the worse my eyes are. I'm going to check with our thread pitch gauge, and we're lined up exactly 28 threads per inch. It looks like a nice fine cut. It feathers out real nice right there. So everything's set properly. So we'll just proceed to cut this down until the receiver fits on. And uh, check fit. Five, oil. Okay. Now we're precision machining here, so I'm going to use the same number on the thread dial for each pass. Taking light cuts the whole time, no, it's not a race, it's precision machining. Here it comes. Engage. Feed in. In feed on the crop compound. Numbers coming around. Engage. And rinse and repeat.
the next branch if you get to about 23,000, something like total depth. Real close already. So, we'll check it. Highly doubt it's going to go on yet. A little bit larger diameter too. This is such a fine thread, you want to be careful. Try to find that first thread. There it is. It's biting. But it's pretty tight. Yeah, it's tight. So, so it's starting, but it only gets to there. So we're going to have to deepen that thread a little more. Along here, I'm going to give it an inspection. Yep, everything's looking great. The uh, crests at the uh, tops of the thread, crest is uh, still has some die cam on it. And our feather, yeah, feathers out nicely at the end here. So a few more passes at least. Clean up pass there, check it. Still tight, but probably just needs a few cleanup passes. Okay, I don't want to get too crazy here. I don't want to gall it. So, before I take another pass, let me just uh, clean it up a little bit with this uh, Kratex. Just gets the burrs out. Smooths everything up real nice. Pull that off. <clears throat> A little anti seize. I'm just going to rub it on my face right now, just to get it over with, because that's where it always ends up. Okay, let's check this. Yeah, that's feeling better. Still tight, though. Eh, yeah, it's a little tight for my liking. Okay. Do one more cleanup pass. Just uh, touching up the bottoms, the valleys of the threads. Back in. Zero. No in feed. We're just gonna clean. Run a cleanup. Nothing. So I'm going to give it a little in-feed on the cross slide this time, just to give it uh, give the tool a straight in-feed, so it'll waller out, not waller, but just, just clean up both sides of the thread, ideally. Engage. Still nothing. Okay. So, 
here's the risk, you know, you, you risk cutting too deep at this point. So, just check it one more time. Freshly cut internal and freshly cut external, especially these internals, not a good way to deburr everything. So maybe we'll just lap this in as it is. Yeah, it's feeling easier to turn already. So let's just see if we can get all the way to the shoulder. We've got our anti-seize on there still. Yep, we're going on, going on. It's a little snug, but I can use one hand. So there's absolute, there's a little wiggle that way, but nothing this way. I mean, we need clearance to be able to, you know, screw on, obviously. Okay, here we go, all the way up to the, all the way up to the shoulder. Nice tight union there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit there. Yeah, it's getting looser every time I screw it in and on. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Let's, let's leave that there. Twenty-eight threads per inch, man. Jesus. Okay. So, threading we're gonna call good. So I'm gonna get my tool out. Next thing to do is clean up that shoulder. Uh, make that ninety degrees square, perfectly square with the rest of it. Get our length. So we cut this a little short. So we'll cut this back till we get seven thirty-five from here to here. So first we're gonna just square that up and then we'll take a measurement and see how much left we gotta go. Okay, right there. Uh, I'm gonna slow, we're gonna speed the machine up. Speed up. And take a pass. Two zero. Blow that off. Just gonna cut a slight chamfer here, so we're not reading off of a a bump there. Slight chamfer. Blow everything off. And we'll take a measurement. Now we got a clean surface mostly to measure off of. Looking for 735. And we got 729 and a half. So we need about five thousandths. From here, Five thousandths, gonna lock the carriage this time. Apron, whatever you want to call it. Compound is locked, so take this cut. I'm gonna go slightly beyond zero this time, and then move the carriage to the right, just to cut out any possible Lift that may have occurred there. And then verify that we're at 735. 7.35. Bang a gong, right on the money. All right, so we've got our thread tenon turned, the major diameter, threaded, 28 threads per inch, and the length has now been established. So everything's good here. We're gonna do another test fit with the receiver.
and I was ensure that this is uh, contacting 100%. Um, it damn well better. I mean, the, the receiver's been trued up, squared up per perfectly. This is squared up perfectly. So as long as we're contacting, there's no air gap, light gap, uh, we're good. So I'll just clean off this guy, the face of this guy, screw her back in. Find the start, there it is. Going on. Come back 10 minutes from now when I'm done screwing this on. This light out of my dang way. Okay. And I'll insert the bolt to give you just a little more leverage. Right there. Okay, I'm looking for a light gap. And I got nothing. I'm going to turn it 180. And turn it 360 and look for any slight light gap at all between these two surfaces. I see nothing. Torque it off. A couple times. Just make sure we're buttoned up against, <clears throat> against that surface. Get you out of there. Get this out of my way. I'm done with that guy. Okay, it's looking like we got contact. Um, actually, we're going to use some inlighting black on the shoulder and just check that. Okay, a little inlighting black, and we're just going to color up that shoulder. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and put this on my face right now because that's where it always ends up. Black out my eyes a little bit. Okay, so now we'll spin the receiver back on, make sure we're touching there. So we got clean, clean surface here. Good. Couple torques. Bump it into there. Okay, we're actually not touching all the way around. It does feel like <clears throat> it does feel like it's not quite hitting that. This portion here that was not cut by threading. Sometimes what will happen is that as you back that shoulder up, this becomes wider. And then it starts actually torquing on that instead of your receiver face. So you can see I've got 65%. So there's nothing touching on this side. So what we have to do is back that up here. Back this surface up, just, I don't know, 20 thousandths or so. Yeah, that's looking like what it is. Okay, so we're just, all we're gonna do is just go into the valley of the very, very last thread. Zero out our cross line. So we'll feed in to zero and then feed this way. About 20 thousandths, just to give it some relief. And then uh, we'll check contact again. OK. 
Okay, that should be enough. Feather out properly. Yep. Okay, so that should be the ticket there. Check. Check it. I'm going to wipe off the black and maybe uh, reapply it here. Still got plenty on there. That feels like a nice hard stop. Before it was a little bit mushy, like you get tight and you can feel like you could keep pushing it. It's like it could, it's not it's not stopping on a hard wall. And now, yeah, you can almost hear it slamming up against it there. Let's check that. That should be should be good. As long as it transferred over. Out here. Yep, it's all black. You can see where it actually smushed. Okay, there we go. Hopefully, you can see that. We got a black line all the way around. 100% <clears throat> engagement there on the barrel shoulder. So, we're good there. Um, now we've got to cut the cone. So these are uh, Winchester 70s, uh, Springfields, Enfields, and then there's a couple custom actions that kind of have a hybrid cone slash flat breech. Uh, but this Winchester is a true cone breech, so we're going to be, okay, cone breech time. Compound is now set at 42 degrees, and this is the tool that I like to use. It's another hand ground radius cutter. So nice wide radius on the tip, reliefs, back relief and everything. Uh, so we're gonna set up like this and progressively cut uh, to depth and width until the bolt actually goes in and closes. Nice. So we're just coming in, feeding in with the carriage, and then taking the cut with the compound. Nine. So we'll just kind of visually check, see if we're close. Yeah, we're real close. I might actually check it here. Let's just check it here. <clears throat> I 
I don't want to take too much. The more steel we got encased in there, the better. Okay, so we're going to screw this on one more time again. Then we're going to try to close the bolt and see if we got a little play back and forth. A little clearance. Clearance. Okay, that's tight and it closes. And we got we got play, so I just call that one good. Correct. Super tight. Closes. A little forward back movement for clearance. So that's it. So 5564, so obviously that's not a very uh, tight tolerance dimension. So that's why I'm just kind of like, okay, let's try it. <laughs> okay, the other thing I'll do is just break it loose and check that wiggle, and it's the same. So loose, wiggling, tight, still wiggling. So we're just looking for a little clearance there. This is not a headspace nail. Headspace, this should not move whatsoever. Okay, so that feature's done. So all that's left is uh, chambering this, uh, chambering it. 65 uh, PRC. So it's a, it's a very, very, very long process. It's fine. Uh, chambering should not be rushed by any means. So let me get set up. <clears throat> I'll get set up here. We're going to pre-drill that chamber like we do. Get most of that material out of there and then finish off with the finishing river. So I'll get this all pre-drilled, set up, and I'll show a couple couple feeds of the, of the camping river, and then we'll come back. 12. Fifty. Okay, next we're gonna go in with a boring bar, true that up. Uh, get all that drill chatter and schmutz out of there uh, so that the reamer so as the reamer comes in so we're I, I drill it short so the pilot will engage the, the bore but as this portion starts cutting it's cutting a true surface not a, not a drilled surface which will eliminate well potentially avoid um, chattering and all that nasty stuff you don't want when you're chambering. So I'm barely going to skim past this until it's cleaned up and true. Then we'll feed the reamer in. I have to put on my pilot, uh, that .2560 pilot, and proceed to chamber. But uh, like I said, I like to uh, true this up um, with a single point boring bar at speed and power feed until that's cleaned up and trued up. All right, here we got another AR Warner tool, boring bar. It's a 3 8 inch, oh, I don't know, four, four or five inch boring bar, whatever. Um, works real well for this, the high speed steel. They also come with carbide. We're just gonna roll with the high speed steel for now. That should be fine. So what I'm going to do is find the end of my hole. So yeah, I can clamp anywhere in here and be fine as far as uh, depth goes. So we're going to go ahead and install this into the tool holder. Okay, just pull up, just touch off. There, and give it about five thousandths in feet, and take a pass. Up to zero, kill the feed, back out. Fine feet about three 
2000s this time. With oil. Yeah, nice chips coming off. It's a full cut. Full clean up cut. All the way in. Zero. Push forward slightly and out. I didn't want to drag that tool back across, but uh, yeah, there we go. So that's screwed up uh, perfectly round with the center axis. Like I said, that's just gonna give us a nice, true surface for that reamer to, to begin uh, its cut. Okay, here we go. I got my 6.5 PRC finishing chambering reamer made by Manson, a .2560 live pilot, which happens to fit this board perfectly. The reamer is roughly set up to enter straight. Um, the way this holder works, as I said earlier, the uh, back end here is held rigidly by a dead center. And then this contraption is a spring-loaded collar that allows you to kind of pivot your way in. So it allows the reamer to actually, obviously no barrel's ever gonna be that bad, but it allows a little bit of play up front. There's nothing in the back. So it's extremely critical that you know that your tailstock is aligned if your tailstock is off, this will not work. It will work, but you're going to be you're going to be coming in at an angle, or or this way, or, or this way, or this way. So, do not use this unless you know for damn sure your tailstock is aligned to your spindle, to your center axis. I check this every time. It's kind of a, a endeavor because we have to strip everything off. Put indicators all over the place, but for the amount of money I charge for my services and the quality of the work, um, it's worth it, right? So, again, I think that's uh, attributing to why it takes so very, very long to chamber uh, a barrel with this setup. Uh, the other nice thing, it's kind of a, a nice thing and, a, and, a, and an annoyance is if this reamer gets stuck at all, it either breaks loose here or it'll break loose here. It won't, ideally, at least the way it's designed, it's designed to not break the reamer. I mean, obviously you don't want to break a $150 reamer. Painfully slow, but then again, like I said, this is precision work, so we're not, it's not a production machining deal whatsoever. So just gonna feed in here. So I've got my carriage as a stop, and we're not engaged in anything other than the pilot in the bore right now. So we'll lube everything up, kick it on, and take a pass. First pass with the chambering ring. All right, so we'll feed in. Walk our tail stock. Slowly feed in, and I'm going to feel the holder and the reamer, check for chatter, once we engage, there it is, super slow, feeling good, sounding good, chips are looking good. So we're going to feed in about 50 thousandths and check it. That's a pretty good chip load there. So let's back out and just check things here real quick. 
So hopefully you can see that. We've cut 50, 75 thousandths out. I finished cutting the chamber. It's torqued on as, as tight as I can get it by hand. The bolt still closes. And so, so common practice with uh, precision rifle building, you take your go gauge and you put a piece of tape on the back, cellophane tape, two thousandths of an inch, to act as a no-go ga no gauge. So, hard stop, does not close. Okay. Pull the tape off, and a minute. Yeah, there it goes. Pull the tape off. And it closes with no effort, it closes by itself. So this chamber is now well within headspace, minimal. Now, as you can see, there's no play back and forth, like I mentioned earlier. So that is sitting, not snug, but there is no play in there. And obviously it won't close on a no-go gauge, I checked that already. So one more time. The go gauge with no tape in the chamber, bolt closes, no wiggle. Pull that out, close the bolt, little wiggle. So that means the cartridge and the gauge from back of cartridge to where the headspace is, is perfect. Once this is torqued on just a little bit more, it'll be even better. That knob probably won't even go that far down, but it should still close on this, so well within specifications for this chamber. Uh, No-go gauge, just, just to show you, same thing. No close. So, <clears throat> the chamber is complete. The chamber is complete. Uh, now that all that's left to do is polish, polish the chamber. Uh, there's no chamfering required on a cone breach because it is a giant chamfer. So we'll unscrew that. Uh, like I said, there's no reason to chamfer that. Um, the cartridge has this entire, it is literally a giant chamfer. So, going to go in there and polish out that uh, chamber. It's already actually very nice finish. Um, the rigidity of the setup uh, provides for a, a real nice finish uh, just with the chamber engraver. <laughs> but for appearances and also uh, reliability as far as cases not getting stuck, we're going to polish that to about 320. And then I run some scotch Brite in there just to brighten it up a little bit better. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to bore you with all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, this uh, breach work is, is uh, very, very close to being complete. Uh, like I said, all I got to do is polish and we'll be, we'll be good. We can take it out, test fire it, check that, make sure the case looks good as it's fired. Uh, measure it, make sure it's not oversized in any area. Oversized in diameter or length. Obviously length is not going to be oversized because it's uh, minimally, minimal head space. Uh, and then another check. So any chamber you always want everything encapsulated in steel except your extraction rim here. So we're just going to verify visually that yes, the main body, everything ahead of this web, as they call it, the web of the case, so it's thicker, thicker in here as it, uh, you know, kind of firing your uh, 
primer sits in there, and then the, the case kind of is, is, is webbed real thick down here. And then it gets thinner a little bit past here. So you just want to ensure, especially on a cone breach, that that is actually sitting where it was. You don't want it like out here somewhere and have a, you know, blow a case out. Obviously that wouldn't even close on a bolt, but still. Um, just one last visual check. Uh, you might not be able to see that from where your perspective is, but uh, well within there, and it has room to allow that extractor to capture it. Um, the, the Winchesters and most cone breaches are going to have a, a cut for the extractor, which we'll show later. That, that comes later in the in the in the process. So um, everything's good here. We're going to chamfer or polish that. Sorry, it's getting late today. Bring. I'm going to polish that and uh, one last headspace check and uh, pull it out, switch it around and do the, uh, the muzzle work. So we'll be back with that. <clears throat> all right, here we got it all nicely polished. Looking real pretty. Okay. So, some of this is just oil and residue, but uh, anyway, <clears throat> that's what she looks like, all nice and clean. So we got, again, just perfect 90 degree transition from the shoulder to the, bre to the barrel tenon thread. Everything's been machined in the same setup. Um, zero run out um, using a one ten thousandths indicator and you saw that earlier there was no no movement in the needle here on this uh, breech end before I did any of this uh, checking throughout the entire process uh, honestly didn't have to recenter um, really at all uh, I kept checking and didn't have any fluctuations so this is very rigid I mean this chuck is enormous so uh, barrel didn't move throughout the entire process uh, headspace has been achieved and uh, yeah everything turned out real nice so uh, we'll wrap this up for the day pull this out of the uh, headstock for now and get ready to do the breach work uh, that's gonna have to be tomorrow it's getting kind of late this evening so I think I'm gonna wrap it up for the day and be back tomorrow with a uh, continuation on this uh, barrel work, Winchester 70.